Welcome to the Bureau of General Services Square Division. My name is Greg Newton. My partner is Donnie Jotun. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, the Bureau, we like to say, is a government agency for a government that does not yet exist. I'm hearing myself talk, which is not good. So <laughs> Shut up. Uh, <laughs> la la, technology is fun, fun, fun. There we go. What was I saying? We're a government agency for a government that does not yet exist. And this is the service we provide, which is holding this space for queer culture and queer books. Uh, so we're very happy to welcome Ben Miller back. He graduated from NYU, left New York and gone to Berlin. Uh, but he did launch his career at the Bureau. <laughs> can I say that? Yes, you can. Okay. Ben launched his career at the Bureau back in uh, 2014, I guess it was, when we were on the Lower East Side. So we're super happy to welcome him back. Now that he's got a podcast and launched a book, which is very fun, as you'll soon hear. But let me formally introduce him and Grace, and we'll get started. So Ben Miller is a writer and researcher. He is a doctoral fellow at the Graduate School of Global Intellectual History at the Freie Universität Berlin. Uh, since 2018, Ben has been a member of the board of the Schwulis Museum, one of the world's largest independent institutions dedicated to archiving and exhibiting queer histories and visual cultures. Grace Lavery is a writer and academic who lives in Brooklyn and wears Missouri. <laughs> I'm so excited that I forgot to do my spiel about donating to us. So we are an all-volunteer organization, and we rely on donations and sales to keep this project going so we can keep doing more events and exhibitions like this. So we have a suggested donation of 10 bucks. I'm going to pass this around. There's change in here. You can give what you can. Um, and if money is tight and you would like to buy a book, you should hold on to your money and buy a book. So with that, I give it over. Thank you. Um, for how should we be dealing with this mic? Is this here for us both, or do we need yeah. to go right in? Or? No, that's no. fine. I think this is good. Okay. Hi, Grace. everybody. Hi, Grace. Hi, Ben. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read a bit from the introduction to the book, and then we'll talk, and then we'll talk, and then I'll sign as many books as you buy. Um, thank you to. <laughs> Uh, Grace for joining me here on stage. Thank you to Hugh Lemmy, my wonderful, brilliant uh, co-author, uh, who unfortunately right now uh, couldn't be with us. He's in England making a film about gay spies. Um, <laughs> what is gay spies? What? The Cambridge. Yes, the Cambridge yeah. Five. Yes, yeah. and it's going to be a studio of Altera in London and hopefully other places too uh, after this fall. Um, and thank you also everyone from Verso, um, and especially our editor, Leo Hollis, um, and Tim and Michelle, and, and everyone else who will be watching. Uh, Yay. So um, I'll start with the epigraph because it's fun. It's from Three Month Fever by Gary Indiana. Homosexuals are widely consigned to the same category of things as drugs, the category of illicit, dirty things that people have to be protected from. Since the homosexual is continually taught by the world around him that his natural home is the sewer, the homosexual is uniquely equipped to discover what truly belongs and doesn't belong in the sewer. <laughs> Introduction. In 1891, Oscar Wilde's star was on the rise. For a decade, he had been the talk of London, a literary wit who pioneered the fashion and philosophy of aestheticism. He had successfully published works of prose and collections of poetry, and was preparing his first novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, for publication, a masterful account of a Faustian bargain dripping with desire, vanity, and corruption. England regarded this sparkling Irishman with a combination of fascination, admiration, and horror but no one could deny he was becoming a titan of the nat national culture. Yet within five years, Wilde's reputation and his health were destroyed. Sentenced to two years of backbreaking hard labor, Wilde was spat at by strangers as he was transported by a train to jail. And upon release, he fled into exile, living in penury under an assumed name. Nobody wanted to be known as his friend. Less than a decade after he had reached the heights of literary stardom, Wilde was dead. It is right and proper that you remember the role Wilde played within an otherwise staid and repressive Victorian culture, as well as the important pioneering work he did describing, in public, 
a form of same-sex desire that otherwise lay hidden and criminalized on the margins. Wilde was one of the first men in British society to give a creative form to a sexuality that barely yet understood itself, let alone was understood or discussed by straight people. For that, conservative forces succeeded in destroying him. But at the core of Wilde's story is his love for a terrible young man, a love that drove him close to madness and sparked the wildfire of events that led to his ruin. That boy, a petulant and cruel son of the British aristocracy, was Lord Alfred Douglas, known by his affectionate nickname, Bosey. Wilde and Bosey first met in 1891, when Bosey was a 21-year-old undergraduate at Wilde's alma mater, Mount Maudlin College, Oxford. Bosey was an archetypal twink, popular and athletic, who cared more about his writing and activities in the new Uranian poetry movement, which idolized pederastic relationships between older and younger men, than his studies, which he never completed. In Wilde, he found his ideal older lover and benefactor, whose work and plays he had already praised in Uranian journals. Their tempestuous affair pushed Wilde's homosexuality from the realm of flirtatious literary innuendo into that of reckless public identity. Besotted with the young poet, Wilde fell in with Bosey's lifestyle and indulged his demands. The two lovers drank and partied together and became the subject of scurrilous rumors. They began to host wild sex parties with young working class men who they paid to fuck or be fucked by. Wilde's public image, an educated and charming raconteur married with children, clashed with his private life. And while the conflict would hold for a few years, it wasn't long before the inevitable happened. Wilde was expecting it. In a letter to Bosey after his release from jail, he wrote, it was like feasting with panthers. The danger was half the excitement. I used to feel as the snake charmer must feel when he lures the cobra. They were to me the brightest of gilded snakes. Their poison was part of their protection. After clashing with Bosey's father, the Marquess of Kingsbury, Queensbury, Wilde was left a calling card from the Marquess accusing him of being a sodomite. Queensbury, having two homosexual sons who he regarded as having been corrupted by snob queers such as Wilde and then Prime Minister Archibald Primrose, fifth Earl of Rosebery, was obsessed with homosexuality. Wilde's friends told him to leave the case well alone, but pushed by an impetuous and jealous Bosey who hated his father, Wilde sued. There was a fatal hole in Wilde's case. He was a sodomite <laughs> and Queensbury could prove it. The civil trial not only humiliated Wilde in the eyes of a homophobic Victorian public, but instigated a further criminal trial for gross indecency. Wilde was found guilty and sentenced to hard labor, which in the end, and indirectly killed him. Wilde's imprisonment, awful and scandalous as it was, came at what was both a dangerous and an auspicious time for the new figure of the homosexual in Europe. Within certain, albeit small, literary and scientific circles, a new identity was forming. Sexologists described the third sex somewhere between male and female. In cities thronging with new proletarian masses and enriched by colonial plunder, a group of people became the first generation of activists pursuing something we might recognize as gay rights. They discussed same-sex desire with sensitivity, even respect, calling themselves Uranians, Urnings, or even homosexuals. For such people, Wilde's trial was an important moment in the development of what would, in the ensuing decades, become something like a coherent movement. Scandals, after all, brought public attention. The newspapers wrote about the dangerous homosexuals, and more people began to recognize themselves as such and be endangered and intrigued by what that recognition might mean. <clears throat> Wilde's utopian vision of love between men remains, in Britain and beyond, a creation myth of the public male homosexual identity. Speaking at his trial, Wilde launched a passionate defense of homosexual desire. Quote, it is in this century misunderstood, so much misunderstood that it may be described as the love that dare not speak its name and on that account of it, I am placed where I am now. It is beautiful, it is fine, it is the noblest form of affection. There is nothing unnatural about it. Such a statement can be seen as a rallying cry for the century of LGBTQ rights activism that was to follow, and Wilde became one of its first martyrs. Bosey became a footnote in the story, an embodiment of evil twink energy. <laughs> A poisoned apple whose path through life left a wake of destruction that led to the great hero's downfall. Yet Bosey, the man, his desires, his attitudes, and his foibles, was just as integral to the eruption of homosexuality into the public sphere as was Wilde. Bosey set the trial in motion, 
Indeed, it was actually Bosey and not Wilde who coined the term, the love that dare not speak its name in one of his poems. No less than Wilde, Bosey shaped and was shaped by the sexual attitudes and cultures of his time. And Bosey's later life of far-right political involvement is just as unpleasant and illuminating as his years with Oscar. After Wilde's death, Boise married a bisexual poet named Olive Custance, and when their marriage went downhill, he converted to Catholicism and began espousing increasingly anti-Semitic views. He wrote articles for the anti-Semitic magazine Vigilante, accusing various people of plots to undermine British masculinity with Jewish homosexuality, and in 1920 co-founded a magazine called Plain English that advertised copies of the anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, defamed leftists and the Irish, and accused figures as right-wing, conventionally masculine, and defiantly heterosexual as Winston Churchill of being involved in Jewish conspiracies to undermine the war effort. Churchill eventually sued and won. After a period of imprisonment, Bosey died poor and obscure in 1945. Only two people attempted his funeral. Attended his funeral. <laughs> <laughs> they tried, but they couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> For years, gay people have remembered Oscar as one of our own, but neglected Bosey as someone who has anything to tell us about how homosexuality came to be. Why do we choose to remember the witty and glamorous Wilde and to forget the Machiavellian anti-Semitic and louche Bosey? And more crucially, why do we assume that Wilde's life and attitudes shaped the track record of the project of homosexuality better than Bosey's? Bosey was hardly the first gay to become obsessed with far-right and racist politics, or to confuse liberation with the freedom to live out his own desires in elevated class status. Bad Gaze is a book about such characters, a book about the gay people in history who do not flatter us and who we cannot make into heroes, the liars, the powerful, the criminal, and the successful. From Alexander the Great to J. Edgar Hoover, our history is littered with them. Unlike our heroes, however, people like Audre Lorde, Oscar Wilde, and Alan Turing, we rarely remember them as gay. And yet their sexuality was just as important an influence on their lives as those whom we celebrate. And their stories have much to tell us about how the sexual identities we understand today came to exist. Over the course of this book, we profile these evil and complicated queers from our history. Among their ranks are emperors and criminals, fascist thugs and famous artists, austere Puritans and debauched bon viveurs, yet all of them have one thing in common. They engaged in same-sex behavior that in the context of today's society, we might understand as somehow gay. By examining the interplay of their lives and sexualities, this book investigates the failure of homosexuality as an identity and a political project. Failure seems like a harsh word, and this assessment, while our primary argument in this book is of course incomplete, there is indeed hope for queer forms, and our history contains many vital living histories of struggle, alliance, and solidarity. In the conclusion, we think a bit about how these histories and the darker stories we spent the book telling might exist in productive tension as we think about the future of queer lives in Europe and the United States. The failure, however, of mainstream actually existing white male homosexuality to enact liberation and its embrace instead of full integration into the burning house of the couple form, the family unit, and what we might hopefully call late stage capitalism is real. And it is arranged on three primary axes. First, it's separation from and fear of gender nonconformity. Second, it's, separate, it's simultaneous appropriation of the bodies and sexualities of racialized people and denial of those people's full humanity, political participation, and equality. And third, it's incessant focus on the bourgeois project of sexuality itself. The first theme is explored in the scholarly work of people like Susan Stryker who have pointed out that homosexuality's project of self-justification has often depended on claiming normalcy at the expense of a gender nonconforming other, the trans woman, the street queen, the person not respectable enough to pass. The second is examined by people like C. Riley Snorton, Ann Stoller, and Anne McClintock, who have described the ways that the bodies of racialized and colonized people and ideas about their social organization have served as the literal substance of white metropolitan homosexual and transgender subjectivities and identities. And the third has been discussed by a variety of queer Marxist scholars from gay liberationists themselves, to classic texts on the emergence of gay identity and its relationship to capitalism, to Christopher Chitty's recent intervention into the correspondence between crises of capitalism and the persecution of poor and working class sodomites. This book aims to explore these themes not through scholarly argument, but by storytelling. 
by retelling the stories of a set of queer lives that are individually fascinating and horrifying, and that collectively communicate a version, our version, of the story of the evolution and failure of white male homosexual identities. It can be very easy to assume that the way that we think about identities has always been the same. Our race, gender, sexual orientation, or nationality can seem like such an important intrinsic part of ourselves that we assume they must have been important in the same way for people living in the past. But identities are, as Stryker has said, where the rubber of larger social and cultural systems hits the road of lived experience. They are constantly changing and being changed by the shifting structural realities of life, by systems of production and exchange, by the ways that we relate to one another. Even the idea that people have a specific sexuality is remarkably recent, perhaps only 150 years old, emerging out of the rapidly industrializing colonial metropolises of Europe. The rigid segmentation of time into separated zones of work and leisure, along with moral panics about backwards people intended to justify colonial expansion and incursions into the supposedly immoral private lives of the working classes, inculcated the idea that who you fucked made you who you are. Even after the invention of homosexuality and heterosexuality in the late 19th century, many people who felt same-sex love and desire did not want to convert their feelings into identities to subscribe to being medicalized and set apart. These feelings were instead sources of shame, crimes for which they could be punished, and social taboos. As some people began to fight for their recognition and against medicalizing systems, movements began to emerge. The people who led these movements, at least the ones who have succeeded in winning state recognition, were often not working class or people of color, but instead members of the emerging bourgeoisie, who sought to assign positive values to their sexual acts within the prevailing value systems of their time, and often, as we will see in this book, to bad ends. At the same time, working class people, colonized people, and people of color have consistently lived, fought for, manifested, and expressed forms of social and sexual expression that have challenged both social prejudice towards sexual and gender minorities and the bourgeois politics of the gay elite. These challenges have often been bitterly resisted by that elite in their time, while still, owing to their embrace of mass politics and disruptive organizing, having far-reaching effects in our queer lives. Often after the fact, the queer elite will belatedly acknowledge these people, movements, and struggles in an attempt to incorporate them into the dominant story of what it means to be gay, lesbian, or trans, as though the working class gays and sex workers, drag queens, and trans women of color at the Stonewall and in the West Village threw bricks at cops in order to win marriage equality for the gay and lesbian donor class. <laughs> It is, this very, it is this process of struggle and contestation that has created the very idea of what being gay or queer is. It has marked the production of queer cultures, the discussion of queer lives, and queer people's search for historical examples to justify their own acts and identities. Even the term gay has changed. 50 years ago, the term had a broader meaning that included queer and bisexual people, transgender people, transvestites, and more, anyone who lived openly outside the heterosexual and cissexist norms cis sexist norms of a more conservative society and suffered as a result. Today, it tends to refer to a more limited idea of same gender sexual attraction. These definitions too are sites of struggle and negotiation. It can be difficult therefore to find the right terminology to discuss people who might fit into such a category today when such ideas and identities did not exist in their society. Can you call someone like James the sixth and first of Scotland and England, a man who almost certainly had sex with other men, a homosexual? when that identity certainly did not even exist as a concept at that time. When he was ruling England and Scotland and beginning his campaigns of colonization in Ireland and America, nobody thought who they fucked had much to do with who they were. So what does it mean to call James or the Emperor Hadrian or any number of nefarious Nellies from our history gay? <laughs> we have decided to use that present day term as a way of putting today's homosexuality under a microscope and figuring out why it is troubled and incomplete and why it failed to live up to its utopian promises of liberation. By discussing these people and their shared behaviors in relation to one another, we can begin to drive characteristics and stories that might shed a light on how a contemporary gay identity came to exist, from ideas of what it means to be a man, to how same-sex desire has influenced historical events, to how the dreaded heterosexuals came to exist, <laughs> and to understand themselves as opposed to queers and to fear and police and repress us. Our subjects may not all have held a gay identity, but their lives can tell us much about why we do. If gay is an imprecise term of convenience, so is bad. 
While some of the folks in the book are without doubt bad fascists, murderers, and other such scumbags, many are more complicated. We can look at their lives in the context of the times in which they lived and see how within that context, their decisions influenced or were influenced by their sex lives. Many were profoundly traumatized by the guilt they felt as a result of their sexual desires. Pushed by society into lives they found themselves unable to lead, they made strange choices or ended up damaging the world in their attempts to reform it. Nonetheless, the links between their negative actions and their sexual desires are worth exploring, worth expanding on. Can we really understand Roy Cohn's aggressive political witch hunting and fear of secret subversion outside the context of his own negative feelings regarding his homosexuality? It is for these reasons we use the categories of bad and gay as provocations to talk more deeply about what we understand both words to mean. If it is not clear enough that we are not writing as homophobes, ask our boyfriends, our lovers, <laughs> our friends. Both of us are deeply shaped by homosexuality, but also deeply unsatisfied by it. This is why we have subtitled the book A Homosexual History, and we mean that precisely. Not just that we are homosexuals, but that this is only the history of homosexuality or homosexual behaviors, but that this book is a dance through homosexuality's usable and abusable pasts. We learn from the broad spectrum of theory by and about queer and trans people, and write from our position as white gay men, about a series of people whose behaviors, attitudes, and actions can help us understand why and how white male homosexuality as a political, identitarian, and emancipatory project has failed. And for the rest of the story, you can buy the book. <laughs> Gay pride. <laughs> um, it's a hell of a provocation, Ben. Good. Yeah, I mean, there's something so powerful about that moment which you ended with about telling us that the project of homosexuality has failed. Towards the end of the introduction, you want to imagine what else we might do other than homosexuality. Yeah, that there is a sense in this book. I think one of the reasons why this book feels so thrilling to me and Thank to, you. I think, a crowd here that is filling out the door is it, it's doing something in the history of queerness. It, it is conscious of itself as yeah. Attempting to change the way in which we do things. I mean, yeah, I mean, these are not these are not conversations that will be or concepts that will be particularly new to people who have spent a lot of time around the academic and activist and intellectual circles where people talk about queer theory and history a lot. Um, these are pretty well established concepts. And one of the reasons why we started the show and wrote the book was that we felt very frustrated by the yawning chasm between what those conversations are like and then what mainstream broader conversations even among lgbt people mm -hmm. are like about queer history especially um where it tends to be you know 10 people you should have heard of on pride month and it's important people 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 should know about it's your happy milk and marshby johnson and it's really important people should know about it. but first of all these people are always spoken about in a very sanitized way that doesn't that's not particularly good at understanding why they were effective political actors in the first place. Um, and secondly, there's this whole other part of the story that isn't spoken about as much. Um, and there's an assumption, I think, among a lot of people in media that anything queer and especially anything about queer history has to be at this 101 level. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it doesn't. That was the bet that we made, and it seems to have worked. So it seems, oh, it, your bet. You Our bet. Yeah, I said, I thought you meant we. As LGBT, oh, no, no, no. I thought we made a bet some time ago. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we did. No. I don't know. Well, I think, well, I, think we, I think I think we made a bet on one display, and I think it hasn't worked. Yeah. What do you mean it hasn't worked? Say, say more about that. Well, it's. I mean, so it's not true, right? Like, it's, you know, yeah. I mean, which isn't to say that conversion therapy works or anything awful like that, but I think it we, might. Well, they, <laughs> you know, <right? laughs> my point is that it's an evil because it doesn't work. Right, right, exactly. Right. You know, yeah, no, 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 we have better arguments yeah. against torture than we can help ourselves. Exactly. Yeah. Like, like, we have a, later on in the introduction, we say that, you know, like for, for today's liberals, homosexuality, when it comes with a nice condo and a little dog, is still an affliction, mm -hmm. um, which is true. Like, it's a, yeah, there's better arguments than, than we can't help ourselves, and it's a yeah. disease, I think. Um, and I think we're seeing the, yeah, I don't know. I think a lot of the, we've had a few questions on this tour about, we were, even when we wrote the book, the period of the intensity of, um, I don't know if I want to call it backlash, uh, but the intensity of um, attack 
uh, against queer people was nowhere near what it is now, and it's just intensifying every week, it seems. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had a lot of questions about how this interacts with that. Um, and actually looking back at the book, I remember going back to look at the book after we hadn't looked at it for the six months after you handed the final edits, yeah. and then you don't look at it, and then suddenly it's there. And I remember looking at it thinking, oh God, I hope this hasn't aged horribly in the last six months. Um, and I actually think like we have to be talking about this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and I think that having a more grown up conversation about our own history is the only way to yeah. get through moments like this, as opposed to relying on narratives that are, that are A, not true, and B, boring, and C, kind of reactionary in terms of how they frame who we are and why we should be I tolerate it, but tolerate is even a word that I would particularly want. To we do, don't tolerate each other. Exactly. And I mean, yeah. one of the things that I think, you know, Leo Bassani says, Mike Warner says too, is that, you know, to be in the company of gay people is to be in the company of people who are kind of bitchy about each other a lot, <laughs> right? And, uh, and, you know, when you're in a bathhouse, Leo Bassani <laughs> says, how happy you are is going to depend on how big your dick is and how tight your ass is and what you look like. And that, right. the, notion, the notion that a gay bathhouse would therefore form a basis for civil rights in a broad sense, you know, absolutely not. You know, what, what one gets hard for is not the same as a person that exactly. deserves human rights. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you, actually, it's uh, people people who you don't want to have sex with also deserve human rights. Yeah, <laughs> which is difficult to imagine. <laughs> like, on some level, right? It's right? difficult for yeah. somebody <laughs> to imagine. <laughs> you know, that, that I, think so I think it's not imagined often. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, um, we've joked that season 10 of the podcast is just going to be a list of names. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't fuck this you know, guy. You know <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Steer clear. And living in Berlin and Barcelona, we have no experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was with your boyfriend in Exeter recently, and he was telling me uh, stories about all of the, the closeted guys that he had met up and down the kind of, you know, bike yes. trails. Yes, anyway, it's uh, quite something. That's another story. It's another okay. Story. Um, <laughs> you know, there are so many ways into this wonderful story, and I, I guess I did want to begin with, with just this collective sense that this book is an event, and this feels like a wonderful event. The homecoming to New York feels Thank like you. an event. So uh, New York is, in so many ways, the center of bad gay history. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and later on, there are questions that I want to ask, not just about Roy Cohen, but also about Marsha P. Johnson. And I want to, I want to think about some of that. Um, I also want to talk about Oscar Wilde. So. Okay. Um, I guess yeah. you know my first my first question though is maybe sort of uh, of a slight different order and it's this bad gays white gays is the project here examining the normalization of the gay liberal subjects around a regime of whiteness yes around a regime of whiteness and also um class position yeah both those two things together okay um yes. say more about so who's the, who's the who's the typifying figure is it Bosey? Uh, I don't know if there's one typifying figure. I think there's a few different strands that kind of run through it. Mm -hmm. um, there's, uh, I mean, we, we joke, we say there's horrible people who happen to be gay, there's people who are bad at being gay, and it's complicated ones. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you have um, people who are really uh, basically irredeemably committed to the most evil political projects you could possibly imagine. So that's your Ernst Rehm, who was in the Nazi party before Hitler, who found the SA, the Stromabteilung, uh, and who is almost made Minister of Defense before the conservatives who brought Hitler into power freak out because he was one of the, he was one of those weird Strasserite Nazis who actually believed in the socialism part of national socialism. And so they get rid of him. Um, and the, the gayness, which all of them knew about becomes the excuse and he's killed in, in the night of the long knives. Um, irredeemable shit. Roy Cohn, irredeemable shit. Um, <laughs> you know, committed to, we, we all know who Roy Cohn is and, and committed to building, committed to building the worst kinds of um, far right, political power in that way. Um, then you have people who are on the more complicated side, who are occasionally sympathetic, uh, but who are ultimately part of the creation of, part of, how do I say this, part of baking the poison into the cake mm -hmm. of contemporary gay identity. So Margaret Mead is a great example here, someone who's a queer woman, an anthropologist, someone whose work is really profoundly shaped by the project of going to the South Seas, to these US, basically using in a way that 
she never speaks about, the network of the US Navy, to go to the South Seas to find what she thinks of as primitive cultures that she can understand after three weeks of study. To, <laughs> she writes this. She's like, um, this, we're, we're moving on from racist anthropology, and so I'm going to go try to understand the culture in its completion. And uh, since we are very primitive, I can learn the culture in sentences. Quote. But anyway, um, so she goes and, and, and she's trying to find, I think it's too easy to say she's just trying to find herself there, but she's, she's, there's something, there's there. something, yeah, she's, yeah, she's looking, she's, she's at least in part looking for a, looking for ways for her to be in life. And then her work is taken up by people who don't actually know that she's queer, um, who are uh, homophile and gay rights activists in the 50s and 60s, um, who then use that work as part of the sort of construction material for figuring out what gay and lesbian people are. Um, you know, look, they're, they, here we have this data, they're like this in Samoa, they're like this in India, they're like this in wherever. Um, and then uh, you have the people who are, people who we actually end up in the book being enormously sympathetic to, uh, but who end up in really rough straits because of what they did. So that's your Aretino, your Roger Casement, uh, mm -hmm. people who, uh, Roger Casement, another, someone sort of on the, on the, on the cusp of, of good and complicated, someone who is working on the, he's working on behalf of the British Empire to report on colonial atrocities in the Belgian Congo and in the Amazon. Um, these reports end up being very influential in the changing of some practices and the development of a metropolitan anti-colonial movement, but he's doing them on behalf of the British Empire, just trying to prove that they're the good kind of colonizer, which they're not. He then ends up taking this anti-colonial thing seriously and runs guns to Sinn Féin during the Easter Rising, gets um, thrown into jail, and during his treason trial, the Brits publicize his second set of diaries, where every day he had his diaries, he was writing down the atrocities he saw, and then he had his other diaries where he wrote down every man he ever had sex with, what he paid, and the size of the day. <laughs> and he was a size queen. Um, and these are joyful documents, but they're also obviously documents that are structured by profoundly unequal relationships of power. Um, and so that's another sort of soup of someone who dies in complete infamy to the point actually where Irish nationalists, there are Irish nationalists who still maintain that the black diaries are a forgery, which they're not, um, but uh, still, who still are really, because he's a, because he's, like, that's used basically to just sort of, uh, to take him down. Um, and so those are the three kinds of stories that kind of weave through the book. Uh, all of them are in some way related to uh, whiteness and class or whiteness, and, you know, systems of racialization and systems of production and exchange, if you want to call it identical. Although, in this case, too, the question of <coughs> Irishness as a colonized white identity. Yes, is of course. Complicated. Yes, of course, of course. And, some, and, and how do you move through, how do you move through systems of places? And also, like, what, one of the, you know, the, the white gay man over the course of this book goes from being a nonsensical thing when you talk yeah. about Hadrian to an impossibility in terms at the era of casement or someone like that to once we get to the end and to the Dutch far right dick uh, Pim Fortine, a kind of dominant identity category within some kind of broadly conceived of LGBT movement. And so that's the, that's also one of the stories that we're telling is how this goes from being a, yeah, how this goes from being an impossibility in terms to a identity category and, and, and why that was a bad idea. Well, and now I'm going to do my thing about talking about Oscar Wilde. Good. Right, because, um, you know, one of the, the points of intersection between my work and, and, and the work that you and Q have done here is around Wilde. And, you know, one of the things that you all, people may not know about Wilde is that he learned how to be Oscar Wilde um, in order to help Richard Doyley Cart market an opera making fun of East Thieves to America. Right. So the only reason why Oscar Wilde learned how to do that, which we now understand, was in order to help a straight guy make fun of queer people. Um, and it was very much caught up, very much bound up with passing as English. Mm -hmm. when, when Wilde arrived in Oxford in, 19, in 1877, he had a thick Irish accent and a stutter. And both of those were gone within a year. So people who met him later said that he didn't start to even have an Irish accent. And everything that we now associate with sort of wildly and stereotype, the kind of metropolitan subject, is bound up in this pastiche right. of Englishness 
So it has this complicated relationship anyway to the sort of bads, right? In the sense that like it exists as something to be made fun of. Right, and it's also camp. Like it's camp. It's camp. It's camp, but it's camp of a bad thing. It's camp before it's anything else. Right. It's travesty from the start. Right. So, you know, the the inference of something else, the kind of extraction, the extrusion. And of, same with way, and same with Minkle, right? Yeah, like, that's absolutely. also the same with you know, mm -hmm. yeah. And the same with Peter in a different register. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I wonder about though is that so we have wild is the wild's the good game. Right. Mm -hmm. Wild, Wild is, the, is the good game because we can sympathize with, we can sympathize with the position of this, this dominated person who is, you know, learning how to survive in a murderously heterosexual, heterosexual world by, you know, creating a stereotype that entertains people. Yeah, gross place. Yeah. Um, disgusting. Can't wait to leave it. Um, <laughs> I, I haven't yet shared my accent, but, you know, the fact is having an English accent does one this. Yes. <laughs> the only reason I have a fucking job. Right? <laughs> um, you know. No, shut up. Anyway, uh, uh, my point being that you know it's these different types of wild, and yet at the same time, there's something about Wild's construction and in the 1980s as the forgotten hero of gay history that runs over some of the real complexities in his oh, history yeah. too. His relationship to women, which was far more committed than, you know, oh, Jonathan yes. Dolan or Alan Sinfield wanted to acknowledge. You know, his relationship to bisexuality, yeah, yeah, yeah. these kinds of things. Absolutely. Um, you know, and even the fact that, it, you know, Bosey as evil twink notwithstanding, the guy was 18 years old when Wilde, the most famous author in England, came to Oxford to pick him up. Exactly. So, you know, there's something yeah. there that if, if one of us did that, we'd probably Expects a word from our friends, you know, exactly. something like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> I hope. Anyway, um, so there's something. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I guess my, my my point is that even the 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 good gay, the honest gay, the kind of heroic lost gay, yes. is a fantasy that's projected back through history. Oh, of course. And I mean, we start we start a book. I mean, the the um, bad gaze is uh, the title is a provocation, um, and it's about. I mean, it's a it's about things that we think are bad, um, but in a way, it's a way for us to get not get that out of the way and then have the complicated conversation. That's too simple to say, but but to somehow once we frame it in that way, we can we feel like we can address complexity. I think in a more you know it, when you're talking about someone like Casement or someone like T. E. Lawrence, um, you know, it's a way of then being able to. It's a way of being able to acknowledge all of the horrible things that they did, all the horrible things they contributed to, and all the horrible structures they were part of, and then talk about the ways in which they're complicated figures um, that would be harder if you went the other way. And I think the same goes for heroes. I mean, this is not a book about heroes, and you know, while the, you were done with the wild sections of the book, don't buy the book if you want a book about Oscar yeah. Wilde. He goes away after what I just read. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we start the introduction with Wild and Bozy because it's this fun little duality. But us. then but then we said we then we spend the rest of the book, I think, tearing down the idea that any such any such yeah. simple duality could ever exist. Yeah. Um, and I think, I mean I alluded to this earlier, but I think that even I mean my hope in terms of what we can do with queer public history is that we can get to a point where um, we're more comfortable having adult conversations and acknowledging complexity. Because even when we're talking about people like Wilde, who we may in the end of the day have a, some kind of a positive appreciation of, um, speaking about the ways in which they were, um, in which they were different from, in which they were flawed, or in which they were, even if we don't want to say flawed, but in which they were different from the way that we, um, we think uh, important or politically heroic people are, is important. Mm -hmm. um, and it's part of what's important about understanding them and what they did, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I, I think it's very clear that this isn't the companion volume to a book called Good Games, you know, where <laughs> we would like, read about who the heroes are. I mean, what you're actually talking about is the construction. It's, it's not actually a book about individuals at all, necessarily. No, it's it's a, a we, about... we, snuck, we snuck this into this. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's a very historiographical theory, in fact, about the last 200 years, about the last 250 years that we try. Um, and it's quite remarkable. Okay, so let's talk about New York City. Okay. Um, 
I think, you know, do you want to go with Marshall Johnson or Roy Cohen? There's something so fascinating. I was talking with someone before the event started about, uh, about the way that Roy Cohen's gayness became sort of resuscitated in the Tony Kushner by Tony, you Kushner. know, and how somehow this character is brought through the pathos of watching Al Pacino, Michael Corleone himself, dying of AIDS. Yes, you know, yes, yes. It's a, I guess my question is, um, There's something about Roy Cohen's, about the world that Roy Cohen built. And Roy Cohen built with Roger Stone, who is at the very least bisexual and in an open marriage and has all kinds of crazy things. I DM'd his wife on Instagram once, just to see what happened. And because the thing was, they were, if you read that, I'll read the email and do some of them send it. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. What did he say? I mean, a lot of things, all in lowercase. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Set to 3.30 a.m. Provincetown time. Oh my God. <laughs> I was just at an event in Provincetown last year where, so it was, anyway. But it was, I don't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> Did you throw a drink at him? No, but someone else yeah, did. Oh, good. Someone else did. Yeah. Um, but it's very odd because it was just like such an outsider in, in Provincetown. Good. Days, good. You know, but he also sort of hangs around. But anyway. Roy Cohen. Roy Cohen created this world with Roger Stone. They created this world with Donald Trump. Yes. And there's something about and every other shit. And every, every other shit. shit. And there's something about <laughs> about the sort of New York money. Um, has everyone seen that? Have you seen that Tickled documentary? Yeah. Fabulous. Oh, you're about the tick the, the about the the guy. guy. Oh my god. Yeah, and he also <laughs> is this kind of like billionaire who lives in Queens. That's, that's and what I said too. Yeah, doubtless <laughs> connected <laughs> with, on list. with Trump and Cohen and and Roger Stone in some way. I guess what I'm wondering about is, you know, what is the history of the American fascist game machinery? Like, how is that something that continues to dominate our lives in, in the background? Because we do think of the, you know, the, the, the narrative of gay becoming, gay liberal becoming, as the one that gives us, you know, Andrew Rannells in the new normal. Right. Rather than Donald Trump. Um, rather than rather one. than Ray Cohn or something. Yeah. Exactly. It's I mean it's the all of these ingredients. I mean fascism and liberalism are all the same. They're built out of all the same ingredients, mm -hmm. right? It's a similar idea about what the body politic looks like, a man, um, and it's a similar idea. A lot of very similar concepts. Of fascism is liberal. Is liberalism is like you know cracked up cousin or something. It's not. Like <laughs> a, it's uh, it's not. It's they're they're not they're not really opposed structurally. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that we that we have found working on this project is there are all of these people who in different ways, and it, um, there's a kind of period of maximum liberal gay becoming where these things are happening a bit less. And then there's a, before that happens, and we think after that happens, you see, you see it more clearly, but people who are clearly far-right fascists, but who have said, an essential part of that is elements of and ideas about the homosexual identity that are really disturbingly similar, or at least rhyme with elements of that dominant liberal one, you know, mm -hmm. the uh, Ernst Rehm saying, um, well, yes, I'm a Nazi and yes, I'm gay, but I just, it all happens in private, what happens in someone's bedroom is no one's business. Um, or um, this kind of masculinist idea about uh, gay cultural nationalism that then, and this is something that I look at more in my academic work, but then you see that refracted in like Harry Hay and the radical theories and people who's also troubled politics, but politics that were probably, hopefully in this room, more comfortable with than Nazi politics. Um, I, I'm going to assume. I'm um, <laughs> um, Or um, where was I going with that? Um, yeah, and so and so you, you see that a lot in the period before before this sort of uh, liberal gay identity uh, occurs in the way that we understand it now, and in the, in the, begins to occur in the in the 60s and, and 70s. Um, and then now, as gay men start to be able to access state recognition more, you see, especially starting in countries like the Netherlands, where Tim Fortown, our last chapter, is from, um, where that state recognition happened earlier, right? Um, the Netherlands had, in, by the mid-1980s, uh, state-funded HIV treatment, um, which, again, not funded the way that activists would have wanted, not something that, from an activist perspective, we want to praise, but not Reagan or Thatcher, right? Mm -hmm. um, there, gay men started aligning with the state earlier, and so you get sooner a kind of muscular liberalism of uh, liberation is our great national project and it's over and now we defend it from the scary immigrants who are coming to take it away from us. Um, and so I think that's the, I, I think that the, that, that fascist, gay fascist machinery 
has been part of the gay liberal machinery or has been related to the gay liberal machinery the whole time. Um, it's just there was a period where it didn't make any sense, and now, now it, and then there are periods where it makes more sense, or or, or where it's where it's more possible for those things to cross over. Am I making sense? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. So another part of the story that you talk about here and there is the repeat, and it was in part of the uh, section that you read just now, the repudiation of gender nonconformity as a sort of you know disgusting element yeah. of queer culture that needs to be repressed in the name of sort of, you know, the muscular liberal, which is to say the fascist liberal, which is to say, right. you know, this um, highly normative construction of a kind of gay male subject. It made me wonder whether, though this couldn't be the companion book to a good gaze, what about that book, Bad Trends, right? That would be a, a story of, you know, various assholes, um, not least John Money and the creation of the modern transsexual as a kind of stabilizing figure. Um, maybe that's not part of the, maybe that feels like it's not part of the project that, that you're doing, but I guess what I'm, what I'm wondering is part of this story has to be uh, the emergence of the transsexual as a diagnostic and then as a social category. Oh, yes. Um, and so how, how does that fit into the, the question of bad gay? So, you know, are there, What's the connection? It's a very good question. Um, it's not, it, it's a very good question and it's not something we talk about a lot in the book. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if bad trends in general would be my project um, yeah. at the moment or Hughes. Fuck um, Christine Jorgensen, it's all. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think the, the, one of the stories, so just, just to lay it out a little bit, one of the stories that we come back to over and over again in the book, is people and we start with one of the reasons why we start with three people who are definitely three of the four well all, all we start with four people who are like well before a gay and MV ever exists who are Hadrian, um, Pietro Aretino, the Renaissance satirist, uh, James the first and sixth of Scotland, and Frederick the Great. And three of those people, Hadrian, James, and Frederick, are in there because they end up becoming uh, projection fantasies for. 19th century gay men who are searching for nationalist, gender conforming heroes to justify their own presence within the bourgeoisie of their time. So you have masculinist gay men in the Weimar Republic saying, oh, we're not like weird sexual steps in between like that dirty Jew Hirschfeld wants to call us. Although Hirschfeld had her problems too. There's a great new Weimar book about that, yeah. which may be here. Um, but um, we're not, you know, weird uh, sexual steps in between things like that. Dirty Drew Hirschfeld wants to say uh, we're real men and we're so manly that we prove our masculinity by never touching women. Mm -hmm. We never, we don't associate with them. We don't talk to them. We don't sleep with them. It's like, ew, ew, girls, gross, booties. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and 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 that then allies with a kind of uh, re reclamation of Frederick as. A kind of national hero figure for the Nazi uh, regime. There's a big picture of Frederick the Great always behind Hitler's desk. They bury Frederick's corpse. Uh, they take him up. He, all Frederick ever wanted was to be buried next to his big pink palace with his Italian greyhounds. Mm -hmm. And they pulled him up from there and they put him in the garrison church of Potsdam and they made this big deal about it. Um, all of this then is doubly interesting when you then look at what the actual lived gender behavior of someone like Frederick was living in the pink palace with the wife 80 miles away. Um, Alas, fortune is a woman and I am not that way inclined. Riding 200 flute concertos, riding into battle with the Italian greyhounds on the horse. Um, <laughs> I'm not making any of this up. Um, and so, and, and so and then we hear that and we think, oh girl. <laughs> but, 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 but at that point, this is actually, all these things are actually um, important elements of this like Prussian national masculinity, this attic sort of Grecian masculinity, which is part of what makes him a, a sort of pioneering man of his time. So that's the like that story about specifically masculinity uh, is really the thing that is really the story that we're telling. Um, and uh, I know that you're a 19th century story. I'm not so really, really. No, I'm not. <laughs> but um, something yeah. that that trans though is a different project, and I think that would have to do with questions about the degree to which people. I mean, there's a, there's a similarity in terms of the, the problems with accepting any kind of fixed identity position. Although I also acknowledge that I'm criticizing that from on top of that fixed identity position. Like I live in it, it structures me. I don't make any sense without it. Um, 
but I think that those, I think that there are, and I, there, are, there are almost certainly, there are almost certainly similar dynamics at play in many of these situations. And it's obviously like, I mean, Jules Kill Peterson, obviously, you look at that in history uh, and understand that there are important relationships between race and class and what, and what a fixed trans identity as a position is. Um, it's not the story we tell in the book, but I think they're related stories. Because also, I mean, like gay and trans history don't make any sense about each other. Like they're not, they're not, they're not there. They, you know, which is not to say that every project about gay people is about trans people, or every project about trans people is about gay people. But as as two historiographies, they don't like if you try to pull them apart, you just get giant holes. It doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah, for well, obvious reasons. Yeah, well, for reasons that should be obvious, but apparently aren't to people like Andrew Sullivan. Oh, so that was that was the substance of the no 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 the substance of the didn't episode about. It. Oh, right. Yeah, of course, and he yeah. was really like it, the email was like, "Oh, I'm not angry about this, but just so you know." <laughs> <laughs> period A period, all lowercase. So our mutual friend Gabe, I love Gabe. Right? We love yes. Gabe tells me that he has it on very good authority that Andrew Sullivan's very good at eating ass, and that's why they keep him around. <laughs> <laughs> He does not speak from personal experience. You know what we call getting your ass by Andrew Sullivan. I'm scabbing. Has anyone had the experience of getting eaten by Andrew Sullivan in their own? You've heard of fancy you weird me. New York books, so the chances are zero. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me when I'm signing your book, you don't have to tell anybody. I would want to review because it's not often that someone gets it. No. Anyway, I did find out that he apparently very much enjoys. Well, never mind. I'm not going to tell it. <laughs> Okay. I, <laughs> you people raise a legal defense fund, and I'll tell that story, and we'll do an episode. Oh, about Peter, and we'll do an episode about Peter Thiel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we need, we need like fifty to hundred million. So buy some books. Damn. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I no, I don't want to have to be blood for one of his weird transfusions or something. Yeah, no. I kind of do. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, that sort of gets to part of the question, which is, you know, to refer to Bozy as evil as an evil twin, because partly to acknowledge that we find his evilness sexist, right? Yes. And that's kind of, that's got to, that's got to shape a little bit, because in fact, the, the evil here is, you know, the guy with one of the major anti-Semites of the early 20th century is as responsible as anyone else for uh, circulating the protocols of the Elders of Zion in England. Yes. Still, you kind of would. You kind of would, yeah. You know? and, and, then like, his, and then his biographer, Douglas Murray, then turns yeah. into him. It's a, yeah. story. it's a really it's a crazy story. Yeah. So how do you write about badness like this without simply eroticizing? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't know, maybe we did. Um, we, made a, we made a very sexy pink book with a very sexy pink cover. It thank you to the camera, everyone, for so for me. <laughs> um, I mean, I think the whole thing is that, and I think we we you do that by adopting really different tones depending on who you're writing about, how you're writing about it. Like, I think you can write about Roger Casement um, in a way that is who also is one of the most beautiful people who has ever lived. Mm -hmm. Look up Roger Casement. Like, Hmm. Um, <laughs> I think you can like no, we, you can find Roger Casebook's sex life uh, enormously troubling and troubled and complicated, um, and still write about it in a kind of fun and sexy way, and acknowledge the ways in which it's troubled and complicated, and that feels fine. Um, and we just there were certain people with for with whom we just couldn't go there. Um, like Raim does not get eroticized particularly in this book. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. It's just it's a for us it was just a ton sexy Nazis is a ton ten. Yes, and then Philip Johnson. Uh, another, another New York power shit who's also yeah. in that right cone, like how everything became awful. Yeah. You know, Philip Johnson's lifelong project is to divorce modernist aesthetics from the question of social housing, which was the reason why architectural modernism happened in the first place. Um, uh, and he was also a right, real Nazi, um, really a Nazi, as the Mark Lanster and the Johnson study group uh, sort of uncovered and we summarized. And um, but then he then, so when he, right, he, this is an authorized biography of Johnson in the 90s, which is when he kind of admitted to some of this, but not to all of it, but to some of it. And he basically said, I was just this silly little gay boy and I saw all these sexy blondes in leather and I just couldn't help myself. <laughs> yeah. yeah, which of us has not at a Nazi party conference? Because <laughs> <laughs> like, Berlin, if they're around, I mean, in real life, there's so much crap. Yeah, like, awful. Well, and this is part of the thing, isn't it? The, when we talk about American fascists, 
there's something there that it's impossible for a lot to say. Well, no, they, listen, the number of these Berlin party girls who were like thirsting over that uh, January 6th shaman guy with the oh, horns. Yeah, that guy. That is really like, just like ladies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not this. My love. Does anyone know how to say my love? Maybe someone does. I have stories about that guy, which I probably shouldn't share. But you know, I didn't know my love. I love him. Do you love him? Do you think he's attractive? My students, some of my students. Your students too. I think he's kind of cute. I don't know. You just saw a picture of him and got evil twink. You know. Evil twink, right? It's like he ruins it by like he like dresses to look more. Interesting that he is. That's you know. Yeah. It's like so a Catholic. It's another one. Yeah. yeah. So do you, I mean, if this is this was the thing that's. Is he a Catholic or is he one of these weird converts? He's, he's a like, convert. Oh yes, he's a convert. But so the, the thing that someone, so I knew someone who knew him. Right, being birth is a small place, um, and 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 this person said the thing about Milianopolis is that his Catholicism is deadly serious. Mm. Um, and in fact, not, everything else is a joke, but he takes his Catholicism incredibly seriously. Which, you know, you're looking away, that's exactly what I did. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did not continue that conversation. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's frightening, isn't it? It's very scary. I mean, I guess, you know, this is a book that tells us that Milo Yiannopoulos is as much part of the story as anyone else. Yeah, and also someone like Milo or Tim Fortown is potentially the future. Of the yeah. Book. And, I mean, the book has two conclusions, right? One of the conclusions is the thing called conclusion, um, where we talk about all of these. We do this kind of dance through moments, various moments when solidarity and queer history actually happen in some kind of functional way. And like, yay, us. Um, and then the, well, not that, but, you know, let's do that instead. Um, and then the other conclusion to the book is, I think, Four Town, which is, and I feel more comfortable, I felt more comfortable saying this in England and Europe than I do here, uh, because I think this is more true in a country where the rights consensus, the military service marriage rights consensus, has been accepted by the center right, right? Mm -hmm. In England, gay marriage is brought in by the Tories. In Germany, it's brought in under um, conservative Angela Merkel. She, yeah, she brought the thing to a vote knowing it would pass and then voted against it because that's how she operated, but it was brought in by them and they seem not particularly interested in changing it, right? Um, but the Republicans but, you know, would. But, no, they would. So yeah. in, in a situation like that, um, the stage is really set for all of these things that are baked into that white gay man cake um, to start really uh, coming out and dominating it. The, um, the sense of uh, liberation becoming a completed national project that is now to be defended from uh, the outsider. Uh, and you see this actually quite a lot in uh, different kinds of gay debates in Berlin, Germany, where I live. Um, here, I think it's, here I think it's, uh, <laughs> here I think it's, uh, here I think it's that it's interesting because you see that trying to happen, but I think the degree to which it can, the degree to which it can develop is limited by the fact that like, you can be just a normal asshole and be a gay Tory, but to be a log cabin Republican, you'd be a real sicko. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so there's a there's a certain degree of like um, there's a degree that of sort of that sort of blocking it from from going in that direction. But that's where we sort of think that's going. And that's the pessimistic conclusion, right? Is that, so, the, is that white gay maleness is a the trough of white gay maleness is just going to produce more fortines and more fortinianism. And fortine is someone who he becomes, um, this is 2002, he's kind of the grandfather of the European New Right. Um, he wants to, he refers to Islam as being uh, quote unquote retarded. Um, and he uh, is uh, someone who kind of whitewashes or, or pinkwashes uh, far right politics by being so gay in public during his electoral campaign that you can be, people can be convinced to vote for him thinking that this is tolerance, right? So he gives an interview during the campaign when he's going to be prime minister. He's going to, he's pretended to be prime minister on national television in which he talks about the way that cum tastes and says that dark rooms are like churches because you're on your knees and the light comes filtering into the windows. Um, <laughs> and then spins that into, and here's why we need to ban all immigration now and send them a rocket home. Um, and so, and, and that kind of wraps up this far right thing into this, into this package of being kind of 
uh, look, we're tolerant. We're, you know, yeah. But you accept, they accept me. So of course, if you accept me, this flamboyant figure, then you're not one of those bad people. You just want to, you know, get serious about the dirty immigrants or whatever. It's a Tony Blair thing too, right? I mean, you know, in 1997, Two when defiantly heterosexual, but in our book. But absolutely, but in 1997, when he was running for, uh, you know, during the general election against John Major's Conservative Party, in every respect except one, the, the, the plan of the Labour Party was to outflank the Tories on the right. Um, so they were proposing lower taxation, stronger control on immigration, longer prison sentences, but an equalization of the age of consent. Yep. And that was it. And for whatever reason, John Major made the stupid decision not to accept that. And so in every single debate interview they did, you know, the side of modernity was Tony Blair coming into power, we're going to equalize the age yes, consent, yes, yes. gay liberalism's here. Never mind that, in fact, what we're doing is we're accepting neoliberal consensus. Right. All these other things are outrageous. Exactly. And actually getting worse. And actually right. getting worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, That's not where I wanted to end. Nor do I want to end exactly with Caitlyn Jenner, bad, who would be the bad trend, right? She would be the one. And you know, she just said, I heard on the television at some point, she was fucking running for governor of California. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. So that's right. right. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, anyway. Uh, that's, no, that's true. true. But imagine if Schwarzenegger was governor of yeah, California. Yeah. How, much, <laughs> how much less weird is that? That's true. That's right. That's right. But, you know, so, I mean, she, she was asked about, you know, whether trans, trans women should be able to compete in women's sports. And her response was that she thought, that one needed to make a distinction between people who are really trans and those who are just claiming to be trans so that they can you know, be around women or potentially to, to thrive in non-competitive yeah. sporting environments. So many, so, so many people are like chopping off their balls to win that $20,000 <laughs> 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 so the myth So the, many people. The thing that was so crazy about this to me yes. is that that distinction between the real and the fake transsexual is as old as the theory of transsexuality itself. And yes. there isn't a single person who believes in that distinction that wouldn't think Caitlyn Jenner is the fake. Right? <laughs> That's the Again, whole problem. That. No, no, exactly. It's a bullshit distinction. It's a right. The Blanchardian psychology has no basis in science. The guy compares transition to demonic possession. It's not true. But the basis on which that distinction is reinforced is on the basis of sexual object trust. Right. That is to say, trans women who date women, like Caitlyn Jenner, are right. not really transsexuals. Right. I just wondered if she knows she was soaring out the platform in the ether. But probably not. I don't think yeah. she does very much at all. Well, um, she's very stupid. That's <laughs> another thing. <laughs> That's another thing, not just bad trans, bad, just stupid gay. <laughs> Watch your case, so we like the smart guy. We watch the book and clap him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, uh, the Winston Churchill anecdote about how um, Tom Driver gives, yeah. gives uh, Tom Driver is the kind of person who saw me a bad name. No, not, not that one, nor the rum saw me in the last one. Okay. It's just Winston Churchill's description for Navy was. Great times, rum, sodomy, and the latch. But the uh, the fun story about Winston Churchill, who of course is a fucking genocidal maniac, if you don't know this about Winston Churchill, bad, bad, bad dude. Um, he's woken up out of uh, bed at five o'clock in the morning by a permanent private secretary. He tells him that a senior civil servant was caught on his knees in Clapham Common uh, at two o'clock this morning, and it's gonna be in the papers in the front page. And Winston Churchill says, last night, the guy says, yes, I'm afraid so far instead. Winston Churchill says, it's sort of 20, 20 degrees below last night, isn't it? And the guy says, yes, I'm so it was very, very cold last night. And Winston Churchill goes, makes you proud to be British. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's annoying. Churchill is, uh, yeah, Churchill would be, uh, Churchill would be interesting. We've thought about Churchill. We've yeah. been dancing back from it. There's a lot yeah. of, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, bites in that direction. Um, Churchill and JFK are two of the ones that we just keep kind of dancing around and we never quite want to go there. Yeah. Because JFK had that friend, what, Len Billings or something? There's that one picture of the two of them, like almost making out. And, uh, but I can see, I think JFK was really defiantly heterosexual and Billings was in love with them, and that's a whole different story. If we did bad, bad uh, gay baiters, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm really interested to hear this phrase described to, you know, used for JFK defiantly heterosexual, because that's what you say about Churchill as well here. And it makes me wonder whether heterosexuality is in general a form of defiance. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, oh, come on, there's always yeah. something with you. Yeah. <laughs>
That's right. Yeah. I remember this, so, I mean, a friend of mine was telling me recently that like one of his students that had introduced himself as uh, straight in front of another student during an office hour, the other student turned to the one. Still? show has a pretty broad remit. Um, the show is anybody who we can tell a diverting hour-long story about. Um, and that goes from people like the people in the book to people like we did an episode, you know, we, we spent a lot of, we, spend, we can spend an hour on the show with Liberace. He's not a particularly important part of this story, but definitely a bad gay, interesting. We spent an hour with Joe Carstairs, who's a probably non-binary or trans mask British uh, American aristocratic oil heir who uh, raced speedboats and then ruled over a private island in the Bahamas with their partner, who was a one foot tall leather doll named Lord Todd Wadley. Um, <laughs> not making that one up either. Um, Lord Todd Wadley. Lord Todd Wadley, yes. And the doll just got dirtier and dirtier and dirtier. Wow. Until like, dirty, grimy, no eyes, like filth encrusted thing. Um, and so people who are, doing, so many of the people in the show are just, are, are people who are, uh, or the show, and at this point, seasons of the show are now half about people who aren't men. Uh, this is a book that is about how the white gay man happened, and so there are many white gay men in it, and then there's Margaret Mead, who is so important to the story that we couldn't leave her out, and Yukio Mishima, because we wanted to look at what happens when the white gay man gets exported, um, and then runs it's into an imperialist. Another, so. Yes, he's still an imperialist, yeah. but runs into another sex gender system, and then gets exported there, and what, like, what does that do? What are those conflicts, and how did that how does that keep to happen. Um, but the show has a, yeah, so the show has a broader remit and then the book is just about this. Um, there are definitely, in terms of people that we've, in terms of people that we started researching and then sort of never gotten through to either in the show or in the, or in the book, um, it's people who, it tends to be people about whom we just can't find out enough to do a convincing hour of radio for language reasons, for time reasons, uh, I mean, the, the, the book and the show are both secondary works. They're both syntheses. We're dependent on, and I think quite generously cite, uh, primary historical uh, and theoretical works. Um, and so if, there, if we can't find a few biographies of someone, then it's hard to, like there's a, and we were finally getting her on the show. There was a, um, there's a lesbian uh, Burmese gangster named Olive Yang who ran heroin uh, for the CIA in the 50s. Uh, and we've tried to we've tried to do an Olive Yang episode twice and just ran into a wall of source material. Uh, and then luckily there's a, a journalist who uh, does things that we don't like speak Burmese um, and has gone to Burma and written a biography and now we'll have her on the show to talk about it when you do it then. So but that's kind of the that's the difference between the book and the show and and, and then how we kind of find people who are done. And we have a long list of about 400 people at this point that we get from uh, mostly suggestions. So please suggest away. Um, because we, we love having people on. Yeah, I see two, two here, maybe in front. That, uh, yeah. Oh, so this is very exciting. I'm, I'm, re I'm re ready to read the whole book, I think. Um, and I, I'm, I'm very happy that you guys did a copy facing project um, <laughs> because it, it'll have many audiences. But for me, who's a pure academic, what is exciting is the control changing. I often tell my students it's very tiring to read a book. And like queer theory is like pages and pages and pages of videos and objects, right? It's something we are really committed to finding oppositional subjects. Yes. And so your book, uh, both of your book, is a very transcendent book in that sense. Like you really can't maintain <laughs> they're oppositional in a bad way. <laughs> they mean a sexy bad way, who knows? But, um, you know, so that's exciting. Thing. My question, though, is in terms of historiography, there is so much detailed work that both of you have done. Sort of, how did you bring together different source materials? Like, just kind of the way that we both do. I mean, it's a so Hugh, who's not here. So, the, sorry, the question uh, for anyone online who maybe didn't hear was about uh, first talking about um, the idea of pre theory and the oppositional figure and how the book challenges that. And second, is a question about bringing together sources of historiography. 
Um, to the first one, I think one of the things that we're really influenced by is recent work by Christopher Tritty, among others, that just moves away from the question of oppositional or not, um, and just looks at how how people who thought about themselves different ways are structured by power in different ways, and thinks that that's a more interesting question. And I agree that that's a more interesting question. Um, and then to the to the wait, and it's not necessarily an opposed question, um, but it's a it's a different way of framing it that that is maybe a little bit more Marxy um, and a little bit more a little bit more interesting for me. Um, to the second one, uh, so Hugh, who's not here, is uh, is a um, history obsessed novelist and critic, and I am a historian who does a lot of fiction and other kinds of writing. Um, and so I think the it's not that he does one thing one way and I do one thing another way, uh, although we do have different areas of, I think, expertise and interest and slightly different approaches. But really for both of us, I think it's the question of how do you, it's, it's the, the idea that um, counter, maybe counterintuitively or maybe not, um, history that is about, we think in critical history, we know in critical history that what we are doing is we are writing about processes and structures about individuals. And at the same time, um, if we want to have that critical history move and affect the way that people think about history in public, um, it's important to also personalize that, not in order to assign individual people the responsibility for having done everything, but rather to, to ask the question, we talk about all these structures, but what does it look like on a Thursday afternoon um, at home? Like, how does it, and there, I mean, of course, there are historians who do this too in their writing. This is not, we didn't invent this idea, um, but um, that's the, I think that's the approach. And then to try to inform it um, as much as we can with um, the histories that were the most interesting and compelling to us, um, for me, outside the academic common, uh, context, it was quite liberating to be able to just ignore things I didn't want to talk about in the literature, um, and which I think is a kind of a better approach anyway. I really don't, I, I think it's, if you don't like something, I think it's better. I mean, unless maybe you need to really go after it, but I think usually it's better to just ignore it um, and talk about things that you think like, um, but maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Well, I also want to. I also want to say I agree with you that this book is so. It's going to be so useful for queer theory classrooms and for queer theory readers oh, and practitioners. Right. It's not just public history. It's doing work in our communities and in our schools, um, and in the discourses that are generating it. It's going to offer so much back because I think one of the things that those of us who work in queer theory often find so frustrating is that we have a, a meta discourse about queerness that seems so far away from the lives of queer people. Yeah. Um, which is the other side of what you're describing where we have a discourse which is not reflected outside. That's true, but it's also true that I think we, you know, we sometimes talk about queerness as though it was a mathematical formula, <laughs> a for mathematical formula that has very little in common we with don't know, people, we like, don't actually, know. We don't know what it means, but we do know that it means oppositional. Exactly. It's kind of nightmare yeah. definition. Of Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, anyway, I, I just, I think it's going to be such a useful historical uh, instantiation of, you know, queer theoretical concerns. Appreciate that. And at the expense of overspeaking, it's really quick. I mean, yes. I also think it's a different genealogy of Clearness, which I think that trans has to look at yeah. is, is the relationship with religion. Uh, because mm -hmm. we often think of modern trans and modern queer as this kind of anti religion or secularist yeah. you know, project. But you know, I think through some of the characters, which is tacit perhaps, is you're asking us to, to see how religion is a integral part of yeah. this production. And there's also there's that great Heather White book, if you know it, about um, yeah. that even a lot of uh, people who don't just say briefly what it is. Um, it's a uh, uh, Heather White is a great book about the ways in which um, is the relationship between uh, uh, U.S. gay liberation organizing, queer liberation organizing, in different forms of Protestant religion, from the wackadoo like people like the you know this guy Mikhail Itkin who declared himself the Reverend of the uh, Syro Chaldean Catholic Church, which is a kind of Catholic church that actually only exists in Kerala, but then he started one in, in Los Angeles and declared himself the bishop of it. Um, <laughs> and, and, yeah, and uh, at one point in protest of a, I think it was 
there was some gay community thing that they refused to uh, uh, endorse the Black Panthers and he ripped off his bitches robes and did a naked can can on the podium. Uh, but then all the way through to mainline Protestant churches, which would actually, in ways that are often not acknowledged, house, they would be the places like this where the gay liberation meeting would happen. Like, where is there a basement with a bunch of folding chairs that we can sit down and adopt and whatever? And that was happening in churches a lot. Um, in Germany, too, actually, a lot. The, the, in East Germany, the churches were some of the only places where, um, where gay and lesbian people could, could meet in the 80s, and the churches and, and uh, Black Haven. In, in the Bay Area, um, recovery. And the MCC, obviously. Uh, Sorry. No, just in the Bay Area, recovery community, drug and alcohol, um, uh, harm reduction community is a huge part of that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously that takes place in church basements. Yeah. So there's a, you know, there is a kind of counter institutional history of the church basement that is. You know, that's, that's a good project. Okay. Yeah. Somebody but talking of good projects, I'm not going to do the bad trans one. So if someone else wants to do that, you totally should. I want to do that. <laughs> also, I mean, if anyone wants to come on the show and do a an episode about the bad trans person we have <laughs> some of the some of the special episodes that we do are people who have a book out and we say hey come on the show and talk about it. we just wrote a biography of this person um and then some of them are also people who write us and it, they don't have to be famous people like people the most recent special episode we did is someone who said i just wrote my MA case about this person you, you call Sando, the, the bodybuilder mm. um, and we have a conversation and we say okay we make sure that you like clearly you've done your work you know what you're talking about you're not gonna whatever and if it's bad if it's bad air we don't air it but um it's really it's it's participatory so please do reach out because we that's how we get a lot of stuff to the show and we really um you know anything that comes in in good faith we respond to also at length uh, usually so uh, please, please write that. Is anyone else just sitting here thinking like queer public culture is fucking alive? This is incredible. You want so much to learn. Yeah, and, and a million people downloaded it. So it's it's, super it's great that that happened. Yeah. But um, it's yeah, it needs it needs to be done, and people were ready for it. The funny thing is, the same editors, the same editors who thought that there wasn't a market for this. We then proved there was a market for it. Obviously not at first, so they bought the book. Thank you, Verso. Okay. Um, but both you and I have taken similar projects into pitch meetings um, and been told to our faces that there's no market for this. Um, a podcast commissioning editor somewhere in what a big UK media institution, I won't say which, um, they, were, they were doing a round of queer podcast pitches and Hugh had an idea, went in with a pitch proposal that included our figures and everything and was told by a straight person that young queer people are not interested in queer history. Uh, well, um, yeah, yeah, fuck you guys. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 the concept has not made it up. It's, it's really, it's funny. Um, sorry, there was a question right behind uh, the last one. Oh, I want to get to it. Uh, Thank yeah, you so much. Thank you for coming. Of course. I, I have to be an architect for history buff, so hearing the Philip Johnson episode was my own thing to say Okay, so I guess, broadly, uh, since the book deals with uh, members of an oppressed group who then act against that group's interests out of the desire for power. So I can't help but wonder how this framework might be applied to other marginalized groups. But uh, I happen to be Jewish and I just keep wondering like what would a similar project called like bad Jews might look like and really like what would be the limitations of applying your historical analysis that you do that days to Jewish people who might have committed racist, sexist, colonial acts. I have a, I, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I, had a, I had a one word answer to that question, but I live in a country where saying it might give people my visa. So, oh, no, no, it was Israel. But, but that's a joke. Yeah. German immigration authorities. Um, <laughs> and I'm also, well, anyway, um, what would a project called Bad Jews look like? I don't know. I think the, um, I think there's probably a lot of different um, kinds of identity formations. There are some, uh, uh, every identity formation is affected by the big, the big structural things um, that I'm being pretty, um, and maybe this is just uh, convenience for myself, but that I'm being pretty uh, loosey-goosey about defining um, in a way that I couldn't get away with if I were in front of a, in front of a, a committee, but I'm not. Um, but uh, some of the, there are some identities that are so closely, or some ways of being that are so closely tied to that, um, that it's hard to imagine. I think part of what's important about this historical analysis, uh, or this method that we're using here, is that you're talking about a group that is important and meaningful somehow um, in, a, in a coherent way, um, and yet, 
and yet has such divisions or distinctions with, 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 within it between people, right? Um, and I think there are times and places where Jews are like that, and there are times and places when Jews are not, just like there are times and places where Jews are like that, and places where Jews are not, right? Um, there are, you know, the, uh, 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 that kind of distinction in terms of relationships to systems of power, I think, exists for Jews now in New York City in a way that it didn't in Germany in 1938, right? Um, and in a way that Germany now, it still less does because of the, of the living remnants of that history, right? But there are reasons why. Uh, these are, there are reasons why these discourses are different there, even if I often disagree with those discourses, um, and even if I think that, um, even if I think that, um, that uh, the way that uh, Germany attempts to police even Jewish criticisms of Israeli state policy is really uh, perverse and profoundly unhelpful for everyone, not least Jews. Um, but Michael um, Lucas. Well, that both. Yeah, right? exactly. Um, but yes, yeah, so there's a whole, so there's a whole, uh, I, I think you could do it. I mean, I think it would end up being different. So I think you're talking about a different group of people with a different history and a different, um, uh, yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole bunch of different things you could do. But, but uh, I think it is, uh, I think it's just kind of basic critical history work and you can talk about different groups of people that way. Maybe it would be, maybe it would be interesting. I mean, there's a, yeah. Uh, hi. So one, running joke in the book and also a significant part of the marketing campaign is evil twink energy <laughs> uh, which i think you know we we know when we see it but i was wondering if you could say a little bit more about it as a kind of distinct aesthetic tradition right as something that you know is uh clearly uh prevalent and connected to the history of bad gays it gets treated sometimes, you know, parenthetically as like a quip in the text, but also like seems to be central to um, the kind of story that you're trying to tell. It's come up in the conversation too. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, twinks don't have a monopoly on evil, as we all know. Uh, <laughs> I've already spoken to you, Connor, about coming on sometime and doing an episode about just bears as a class. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, yeah, well, no, it's bad. It's bad gays. The podcast is about the Christian history. The episode is called Bears. Um, <laughs> but but um, Andrew Sullivan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I did that already. Um, yeah, no, I mean, uh, so the, the aesthetic, the aesthetic uh, category of the evil twink. Um, we think about the evil twink mostly in the book as the um, kind of uh, uh, object of affection of someone that leads them to ruin or downfall uh, or that leads them or who is kind of or who is someone who 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 is treated often very terribly by that person right Antonis is maybe murdered by Hadrian pushing him off the boat uh, but then uh, Hadrian uh, builds you know dozens of cities to his, to his name and to his memory um, is is there well I don't know is there an intellectual tradition of being an aesthetic and intellectual tradition of being kind of young and pretty I guess there is um maybe it's that it's an I, what it looks like probably is different over place and time but i think it's more about a kind of it's more about a relationship to desirability um and i don't think that you actually need to be like skinny and beardless to be an evil twink like i think evil twink energy is also possessed by you know the like whatever like if we like cut to nowhere right now whatever like you know, beefy butt and a snapback is like refusing to look at anyone in the face. Is like also <laughs> demonstrating evil twink energy, just in different, in different sort of, in different bodily form. Um, yeah, I would say that, but it's a very good question, and obviously one that I haven't thought about yet. In psychoanalytic terms, I can think that what we're talking about is, you know, that the male like in Freudian terms, like male bearer of female masks. Yes, right, and it's so it's also a gay man. Right? It's also the gay man. Right. And it's like the, 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 the evil twink is evil because he cannot help but want to fuck him. And he knows that. And that power seems to, yes. you know, override or overrun whatever other structural powers. You know, right. But then, but, power then isn't, but, then, but then it doesn't often. It, because often, doesn't. because often the evil twink gets destroyed, right? Yeah. Like uh, Antonis gets destroyed, right? Yeah. And, uh, from the perspective yeah. of the evil twink, the, the evil twink isn't evil. Of course. It's only from the perspective of the one that can't help but wants to fuck him. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Um, and feel powerless in the face. And so powerless yeah. in the face of it. Yeah. And then 
So then maybe the evil twink is actually fake, because the evil twink is, is showing up or, or undermining the power of the uh, power of the king. There's a joke in the book I wish I had written, but uh, Hugh did, uh, which is that uh, there's power in being the king who sits upon the throne, but there's just as much power in being the throne upon whom the king sits. <laughs> um, other questions? Hi, yes. Hi, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about um, why, like you've done it a little bit of the Eileen Warner, Jeffrey Dahmer, and Gary Bishop episodes, which uh, were excellent. I especially like the gentleman who came on to talk about Gary Bishop. But can you talk a little bit about why specifically this time you're not taking criminals and doing kind of a more true crime? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so the question for people online was about why it's not more true crime Um we have, I think what makes the show work is that we have a balance of topics and also a balance of moods. Uh, so we limit our number of serial killers, we limit our numbers of episodes about themes like um, child sexual abuse or genocide or things that are like just very heavy um, and important to talk about and important and related to sexuality in important ways, but also I think if it was, it wouldn't work if it was just all on that register. And then we mix it in with the Liberace's and the, and the you know, the episodes that are interesting. And to try to have different time periods um, and different genders now after the first couple of seasons and also different, different kind of weights um, and interests. Um, in terms of why not more true crime specifically, um, Hugh and I both kind of detest true crime um, as a genre. Um, and we just didn't, I mean, our, like our rules for the show were no, um, no banter and no drinking wine. Um, on set, in the in the uh, to stop each other. Sorry, that was bad. Sometimes, very bad. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, we we didn't want to. Yeah, we didn't want to make it through crime show. We wanted to limit that to its. I mean, it's an important part of the story. Those are important stories to tell. We like telling them, but we always try to find an angle about telling them that is somehow. If we do a story like that, we want to kind of oppose the true crime narrative, right? And so the, the whole episode about Dahmer was about how Dahmer shows up all of the true crime conventions in these really important ways, um, or at least all the sort of mainstream true crime conventions, consequently. I'm sure there are, there are definitely interesting things about crimes that happen, right? In Cold Blood is one of my favorite books ever written. Um, it's not that I hate the idea of writing about criminal acts. Um, it's just that there's a, you know, we want we, we do an episode about Jeffrey Dahmer in order to talk about how the fact in order to talk about the fact that the um, guy who got Dahmer uh, finally arrested is uh, like died in 2017 while experiencing homelessness, um, and the cop who turned one of Dahmer's victims back over to him and threatened to arrest and imprison the black women who knew this kid and tried to like hand him over to the police. That cop later became president of the Milwaukee Police Association and retired with full benefits. And like, that's true crime, not the story of the like heroic cop chasing smart cop chasing the smart serial killer. Uh, it's that these people are that like, the killer like Dahmer is remarkably stupid and the cops are even stupider and more useless as they were in Valde, as they were everywhere else. Somewhere between stupid and useless and actively evil, they're both at the same time. <laughs> uh, Brett Brown. <laughs> it has to be also that the podcast is interested in what bad gays look like from within that kind of like homophile queer community. You're not interested in the badness that is presented in a straight world, right? So it's not right. like, well, but sometimes we are to undermine it, right? So like Casement, yeah. right? Or, or yeah. Aretino is someone where that, that's where the badness comes from. Then there's usually something more complicated. But also the internal, that internal uh, lens is the most important one. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I'm curious, and Koch, Ooh. So I was asked about Ed Koch. I would really? love to do. Oh yes. I didn't know. Oh yes. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, oh, yes. So I, I haven't been in New York. So I, think, oh, I think that next season I would like to do an episode about Ed Koch and Larry Kramer. <gasps> yeah. At the same time, <laughs> because they hated each other, right? And Kramer knew that Koch was gay. And Kramer, they lived in the same building. And Kramer would be taking his dogs out and say, "Oh no, don't don't go over to those. That's the man who killed all of Daddy's friends." <laughs> um, oh yes. Yeah. No, Kosh was very good, and they were they were like boyfriends who were never public, and was like, oh yes, 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 yes. And that's why when Mario Cuomo ran against him for mayor of New York, he put up signs saying "Vote for Cuomo, not the homo," and that was Andrew Cuomo's idea to do those signs. Wow. Um, yes, but um, yeah, and that was. And a, yet we still don't call him Ed Koch. <laughs> 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 I mean, 
call it the Koch brothers, I can understand. But, you know, tell me. I know. Uh, final questions, or should we, should we sign some books? Oh, one more in the back. Oh, two more. All right, so we'll take you first in the very back, and then uh, the person in the King County Church. You, no, you, that was you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, yeah, um, I, I was wondering this. So, uh, like, obviously, like, you would have, you know, th th there's a, a, a lot of, especially with, for like European figures and places where like the Catholic Church is very, very powerful, of course, there's like, you, it plays a role as like an institution that enables, like, a really horrifying amount of abuse a lot of people have. It. And, but you, you have, uh, you, like, you haven't yet chosen to do like an episode about like particularly infamous like Catholic prelates. Um, people like people like um, um, the, the 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 old Cardinal New York. Um, oh yeah. The, 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 yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, Cardinal Spellman. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, old Nelly Spellman. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, um, that was, is is that is this part of the choice? Is is this part of like your choice to like keep lighter on the sort of more on the on, to go lighter on the on the, the, the really sort of guru that horrifying story? I feel like just... we're just getting to the point now, or like last season, a couple seasons ago, where so we we, we build trust with an audience over time. And it's something that we do not take for granted. And it's something that we did, I think, because on the one hand, we show our work when we talk about something complicated. We really explain where we're coming from. And people can decide at any point where they disagree or agree. But at least they know how we got there. Um, and the other thing that we did was we listen to feedback that comes in good faith. And we respond in good faith. And we often end up having really long conversations with people. Um, which we really, yes, but like, yes, exactly. Yeah. Which actually, I was just about to talk about this. Yeah. Um, so we did the first episode that we did that was really about um, child sexual assault um, was about the composer Benjamin Britten, who had a series of uh, very complicated and troubled relationships with uh, teen boys over the course of his career. And we got uh, from Grace's husband a really wonderful piece of feedback about that. And we, that was mostly very positive and then there were questions and we went back in and we engaged with it a lot. Um, that is to say, I think we're just getting to the point now where we can do something like that and know that we, A, know that we're going to do it right, or at least know that we can do it right enough to not be doing active harm. Um, and also to know that we have trust with our audience where that if there's disagreement or if there's people who don't like what we've done, we'll be able to have those conversations constructively and productively. Um, so that's actually a really good idea. I would love to do something about that also because I think that we need to, in this moment where somehow it's these like, um, these kind of um, uh, wide-eyed uh, Catholic converts who were pushing a lot of the most mm -hmm. horribly uh, homo and especially transphobic stuff in the discourse right now, uh, and they want to call us groomers when the Catholic Church is like a kid fucking ring with the church attached to them. Like, you know, um, if people got uh, abused in uh, gay bars the way people were abused in Catholic churches, every gay bar would be a smoldering pit. I mean, it's like, <laughs> and so I think it's a really important theme to talk about uh, and to talk about in a, in a complex and and just and nuanced way not in the way that i just talked about it um, <laughs> and so um i would like to uh i'd like to do it that's a really good suggestion thank you it's important to do it in that way too though well, yeah i mean and just for the record danny was so grateful for that conversation it was it was i was so grateful for that conversation yeah, it, was, it was a yeah he's, he's a big fan and he has something to do anyway whatever. it was a it was a model of it, you know it's well, something I'm really grateful for is in a very heated discursive moment that is heated for good reasons, people are scared of Gustav and they should be, uh, that we have built an audience that is willing to trust us enough that they'll have these conversations with us. And that's something that I really appreciate and do not take for granted. And uh, yeah. that's why we try to have them when, when they happen. There was a question there, I remember. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, it's over time throughout doing the podcast and everything. Is there kind of like a criteria that you have developed over that time to like qualify some people as that? Like, is there anybody that you did research on? They did more research that you did and kind of found that maybe they weren't that as complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we end every episode with that or not, gay or not. Um, <laughs> and usually, usually, if we can find enough information about somebody, um, and then at the end of the episode, we're concluding that they're less bad than we thought, that's interesting. Um, and so usually we make the episode, we go ahead and do it. Um, in terms of finding qualifications, not really. I'll say that the when we went to turn the show into a book, 
um, and wanting with the encouragement of, of Leo Hollis, our wonderful editor, to make the book more than just a random collection of chronologically oriented profiles, but actually something that had arguments. Um, that we, the themes that we kept coming back to in the book, which is the um, getting away from the born this way idea um, and the relationship of um, racialization and, and systems of production and exchange to sexuality, um, the relationship between the white gay man and the colonies, the relationship between the white gay man and the creation of capitalism. Um, those were the stories that, that we felt were the most urgent that we were telling, that that's why we sort of made the book around them. Uh, they're not really criteria, but they're kind of, they're, they're themes, I guess. Uh, else? Would you like me draw things to a close then by just saying how much a pleasure this has been and how much I love this book? This has been such a pleasure. Thank and you so much. Such I, a love it. That's I'm, I'm, I'm truly uh, grateful for the work that you're doing in the world. It's so important and so necessary and it's changing the world for the better. Good gay. Good gay. <laughs>